Uh, do you know anyone who went abroad before 1989? Was it possible yeah. in any way to, to leave Albania in that time? We haven't uh, any, any information what happened uh, in uh, other country, in border. Mm. We, <laughs> we don't know what happened in Albania, in uh, other city, different, uh, different city. There is this author, his name is Georgi Gospodinov, and he has this book that is a collection of his essays uh, that is called uh, Invisible Crisis. And he tells very interesting stories connected with foreign traveling and how it was not possible for, for most people. And he tells this joke that actually a lot of people in Bulgaria used to think that the Eiffel Tower in France, in Paris, it has um, it had a thermometer on itself because this was a souvenir that uh, someone got from such a foreign trip, and it was a keychain with a little um, thermometer on itself. And these objects, he writes, uh, turned into some turned into something um, much more important than what it was supposed to be. It was not just a keychain, it was just a symbol that someone from the family, from the city, was abroad. small kit, I remember with a lot of joy. Uh, the plastic memorabilia, gondolas and uh, the doll, which my grandmother and uh, my auntie Erna have brought from Venice. So this was something what I have not experienced immediately, but uh, there was this spirit that they went somewhere and they have been telling us a lot of stories. Uh, and we have been very interested for that. So uh, in the 60s, uh, besides opening borders for uh, workers and experience of first gastarbeiters, uh, when a lot of uh, Slovenes, Croats, Serbs, Bosniaks, everyone uh, left mostly uh, to Germany to work, uh, and uh, to eventually earn more money, bringing some money back. Uh, small excursions have started also. And for my grandmother, that was Venice. And for my aunt later, it was also London. Uh, tourist packages became available in the 70s. Uh, people earned more and it was possible to travel to the West. So that opened new, exciting perspectives I would say that the uh, late 80s brought a lot of mobility, even to like people like my family who lived as, uh, um, in a rented flat uh, with uh, two people working but not having so much money. I remember vividly going to Austria for skiing uh, in 89 and discovering um, the, possi the possibility of going to another country. In my country, I belong to a minority. I mean, it was the Cold War, and um, and there was a there were waves of anti-communism. And as I belonged as a child to a communist uh, family, and for example, I did not participate in um, in school. I did not participate in religion. We were without religious confession. That was not usual usual in in Austria, which. Uh, was a kind of very Catholic country. And uh, yeah, for me, so I, I came to feel a little bit like a minority in my own country. My life in 1980s, well, it was, um, I was a teenager and I was uh, awfully angry. I was uh, enraged against the regime. Uh, I felt it so um, unjust so um, reckless so but of course i was uh, that's how my parents raised me and not everybody was sharing this worldview and many people just adapted and um, 
but my life meant uh, uh, not having enough food, not finding mm, food like meat and cheese and milk and uh, you know the staple foods. Uh, it was uh, getting worse and worse every year. My my cousin who was a teacher in the north uh, of the country in Moldova. She came with two uh, briefcases, with two uh, suitcases of beef, all the way by train, ten hours by train, with two suitcases of beef to feed the, everybody in the family. And she sold the beef in in town. Before, so in the November 1988, I was called uh, to the service of a National People's Army. This was the official name of the East German Army. I was uh, that year 19 years old. Luckily, we never were called to, to break down any demonstrations, but uh, the fear about that was, was significant. Then, um, on the 9th of November 1989, when the wall came down, this event doesn't had much um, resonance um, in our barracks, but simply of the fact we were so far away from any big cities or we were quite far away from Berlin. But then, a day later, luckily I had um, vacation and I went to Berlin and then when I dropped in the, in the, the city trains, then I recognized and realized, wow, the wall came down because all people in the train were speaking about that and we were, we were very funny and in a very enthusiastic atmosphere. And I went to, to a friend in West Berlin uh, who made at that evening a party and I dropped there in and they looked at me as <laughs> so confused or like a man of the moon suddenly came up there <laughs> and I was also very confused with my emotions and feelings and, and uh, they, I remember they all the time asked me how do you feel now um, without the wall and, and the freedom and, and I, I, I couldn't answer properly about that because I was so overwhelmed uh, by emotions. But then I spent there 36 hours. We went out to the city and to the cheering people who were dancing on the ball and all these things are experienced and they are so uh, fresh in my mind. So as, as I would happen a uh, week, week ago. So uh, basically in 1989, in December, it was a hot day for December, and I, would, I heard from a truck this information that imperialist forces are trying to destabilize um, the, the regime. And, uh, and it's interesting because at kindergarten, they made me love Ceausescu, but I did not know that. I just knew that I had to love Ceausescu. And then I had to watch his execution on Christmas Day in the morning. And it was for a six-year-old, it was quite a grueling uh, experience to see this, these people being shot, while also being afraid that my parents were in Bucharest, as my uh, my uncle and aunt were in the in the square. I was afraid. I was afraid every day that they would be shot because we were seeing this on TV. And uh, yeah, and add to add uh, add another insult to injury. Santa Claus was uh, my grandmother told me was stuck at the uh, the borders, and this year will not be able to join us. 
we were in heaven. We were so happy and we saw everything changing and um, nothing will stop us to be better and to, to live better. So though I was five years old, <clears throat> but I remember clearly that my, um, my aunt was in Bucharest, was studying there and I was very uh, frightened for her and I was watching TV. I was understanding that something bad is happening, not really knowing what. We had own money, but, but no money for bread and, and butter in principle. So very difficult situation and many protests and also not very good relations between the Russian part and, and the Estonian part of suicide. I remember that my mom's reaction was really kind of strange. She was afraid. She was frightened what to happen now. And uh, we didn't understand anything, my sister and I. Uh, but um, living in Yugoslavia, people had some kind of feeling of security uh, that everything will be all right as long as they are doing their jobs and uh, what is expected from them to do. years were very problematic in, uh, let's say, our country because it was part of the Federation and uh, what in that time went in Europe, like uh, changing, uh, liberating the borders, here was the opposite of it. So a lot of, uh, let's say, borders were created and what we used to do in the previous period, like travel uh, more or less without limitation, Immediately, the, let's say the passport of new uh, countries were limited. You have to have a visa to go abroad. My family, they moved actually from Western Germany back to Croatia in 1990. Uh, with one wave of this enthusiastic feeling, it's going to be okay. They actually moved uh, from München to uh, Karlovac, a small town on the on the border with um, what was then from 91 becoming uh, the Republic of Serbia, the Srpska Krajina, so on the on the first border of um, of war, and of course their their belongings and the apartment were severely damaged, and they lost everything in one year of this um, very crazy uh, idea of coming back. What was important for I think my whole generation and many others is that. The year 1991 became like a mental landmark because uh, after that we referred to, for many years we've been referring to to time to the timeline of our lives as life before and after the war always what was it like before and what was it like after the war um, so here yeah, I wanted to kind of play a joke on you what what's the connection between uh, Lada Samara and the German Shepherd. Well, you can fit seven people in a Lada Samara, but not um, not the German Shepherd. Is this is how we fled? We were seven people uh, who fled in this car from Vukovar. My family, my uh, parents, brother, sister, and grandparents, but unfortunately, not my dog. At some point in, well, might have been 1992, in a geography lesson, we uh, had to know all the capitals in Europe and the world, I think, and I was like best in it. And my teacher wanted to uh, give me one last difficult question. And, but he only, I needed to pull uh, some questions and I, I took, I pulled Germany and I was so confused and I answered Bonn. Because I really, at that point, and then everybody was laughing, and I, I didn't know. I thought, well, why? Wasn't one the capital of Germany? While having been in my transition, I completely missed German transition. Not knowing at that time what they've just been through. And it only came to me later, so this was, uh, of course, a major laugh in the, in the classroom. The processes underneath are more important than the events. I believe this transition, of, if we're talking about 1989 and, and some years before and, and years 
later, it is just very important influence to our collective memory. And, and memory stays for a very long time. And, and changing memory, collective memory, is not, is not easy. I did not get lost in transition, but found myself in a way anew. And I think all of us found our true identities and in, include these transitions in our identities. And I think that uh, thanks to the regime change, I can enjoy my, my human rights, uh, of course, the different kind of freedoms, um, freedom of birth, mobility. Every time something good happens to me, uh, freedom-wise or uh, from uh, my uh, from my uh, business life or so always I'm saying thank you guys and I know what I meant thank you guys those teenagers that were on the frontliners that time because I got the freedom everything changed absolutely everything for me like the world opens I could travel I could speak freely I never ceased being grateful for the privilege of being able to speak freely I, I never forgot how it how it is not to be able to and uh, I'm happy to see that generations now don't know how it feels <laughs>